I'm Coyote Peterson, and this is an ocelot. Hi, buddy. Ah, jeez, bit me right in the face. There's an old saying that things go bump in the night. And if you were out exploring the darkness of Costa Rica's most diverse region, the Osa Peninsula, those things that go bump also stalk stealthily in the shadows, just before they charge, pounce, and attack. Whoa, that's a wild ocelot. And she's right here at my feet. Look at that, how cool is that? Fortunately for me, in the encounter you were about to witness, I was about to become a playmate, and not an item, on the Rainforest Nightly Menu. Ready? Yeah. Okay, so let me tell you what we have going on here. This is really unique. Uh, we're out night herping, looking for reptiles and amphibians. Walking down the trail, I literally stop, and I'm shining my light on this giant wolf spider, biggest wolf spider I've ever seen. And out of the darkness, I hear, and boom, an ocelot just zooms right past me. And let me see if I can get her back. She likes my snake stick. Wait for this. There she is. See that? She's gonna come right up here. And, ah! Ah! She's attacking my arm. Where are you? Come here. Come here. Come here. Ah. Oh, there she is. Look what I got in my hands. Look at that ocelot. Hey, buddy. Wow. And she is a lot heavier than you would think. Okay, can you stay here for the scene? We can play with the snake stick. She's gonna be all over the place while we're filming. This is a wild cat. However, she is used to humans. She hangs out on this trail. We were told if you walk this trail at night, there's a good chance that you will come across her. Let's see, what else do I maybe have for you to play with? Let's see what we got in my pack. I'm sure there's something in here that a little ocelot would love. Oh, yep, there we go. Took the pack off and now she's on my back. Maybe just the pack itself. Look at that. Oh yeah. We wrestle with the pack, wrestle with the pack. Huh? Get it. Get it. Look at that coloration. Now this cat blends so perfectly into its environment. All this cryptic patterning allows them to stay hidden in the shadows as they're moving through all of this foliage. Come here. You come here for a second. I'm just gonna hold on to you and, and, and take the risk of a bite, oh, and a scratch. A paw to the face. A paw to the face. <laughs> How about a little belly rub? Yeah, I hear you talking. You got that pack? Can you see her face? Oh. Look at that. Now this is just like a big house cat. She's only about half grown right now, but look at, she weighs about 25 pounds. Oh, I see you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, ah, yeah. Oh, she's biting my ear. Oh, she's biting, ow. Is that a kiss or a bite? Oh, you're so cute. You're so cute. You are. Don't go for my jugular though. These cats are lethal once fully grown, and they can take down pretty much anything that's out here in the Costa Rican rainforest. All they have to do is run, leap, sink in those front claws, and then a bite to the jugular, and she's got a meal. Whew, that was crazy, kissed by an ocelot. Where'd you go? There she is, and the pounce. Oh, oh, <laughs> Mario. Uh oh, oh got the man. camera, man. Now she has found the microphone. Oh. Oh. No, no. Mark, I think we need a new mic. We, ju we just need one for ocelots to play with. I knew it was a matter of time. <laughs> I was expecting creepy crawlies, not something as cute. Oh, as an ocelot. <laughs> you, you gotta get that landing down, you know that? That's what she does. She's been leaping, come here, from log to log, and she literally launches over the log. Oh, yeah, oh, let go, she says. Oh. So, Coyote, is this rare? This is probably the most unique thing I have ever done with an animal. Ah! Yeah, she's got a hold of me now. There, see, that's what she would want. She's going for the jugular, and hopefully she just doesn't bite me hard. Ah! Okay. All right, I'm keeping my eyes closed so I don't take a claw in the eyeball. That would be bad. Look at so, this. So just so everybody knows, this is not a captive animal. No, this is a wild ocelot. 100% wild right now. Now, I would never recommend you go out in the wild and ever try to get this close to an ocelot, because if it didn't want to play, it could really do some serious damage. And she is just loving me right now. You are just the most adorable thing I think I've ever met. Your hat's all messed up. Well, yeah, probably did a number on my hat, didn't you? Let's so is see. This, is this a kitten? 
This is a kitten. She's probably only a few months old, and you can see those paws. Come here, let's take a look at your paws. You see those paws right there? I see, yeah, you try to whack me in the face with those paws. Those paws are how they climb so well through this rainforest ecosystem. Is she behind me right now? Yeah, you're probably gonna get pounced. I feel like when I make these sort of movements, that's when she pounces, and that's what they do. They creep up really slowly, staying hidden, and then they see a sudden movement like this, ah, and they do that, a paw in the mouth. They go right for the neck, or the head in this case. Ah, jeez, I just got bit in the eye. And then they have their dinner. Ouch. Ooh, ooh, she's licking my ear. That feels weird. I've never had my ear licked before by an ocelot. First time for everything. Ah, yep, yeah, ooh, that's good. She's training right there. She's going for the back of my neck. Hopefully she's not gonna inflict that death wound. Ow, 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 ow. Ah, <sighs> yeah, okay. All right, guess you're there. Ow, I see you. You're so playful. Now, if I was one of her litter mates, this is exactly how she'd be playing. You know, those claws are sharp, the teeth, are sharp. I'm getting slight little itty bitty punctures here and there, but nothing that I can't take. Not to be this close to such a cool rainforest creature. I'm sure it's probably pretty hard to believe what you just witnessed. Coyote Peterson, palling around with a wild ocelot. But believe it or not, it's completely true. For nearly three hours, this curious cat followed the crew and I through the rainforest as we observed and filmed her behaviorisms in a totally natural habitat. This sort of an encounter with a wild animal is something one can only dream of. And I feel incredibly fortunate to have shared these moments in time with one truly special cat. Right now she's just playing with it. That now you see the crab's defensive posture there. He's got the pinchers out saying, yeah, get... oh, 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 yep. That's the lesson you learn. Get too close to a crab and you're gonna get pinched in the face. Look at her, she's like, ouch. And she's timid about it now. She's definitely hesitating. She's like, wow, that crab definitely packed a punch. There he is. Look at that, Osa. There she is, now she's seen it again. The crab's looking at me like, dude, you're blowing my cover. This is a good opportunity for her to learn to hunt on her own. Oh, see, this is that moment where it's like, well, that's a pretty nasty pinch. Go on, you can do it. Eat the crab. <laughs> Eat the crab, Osa. It's right here. She smells it. She knows it. You can see how hesitant she is now. Oh, she's coming in from behind. This is a smart play. The pinchers can't get you from right there. Oh, the crab's like, oh boy. You better spin around. She's looking at it. Now the crab, you can see the coloration there, it blends right in with the leaves. And at this point he's tucking in his pinchers thinking, all right, the predator no longer knows where I am. Oh, hey, there. He's laying down in the puddle now. Dude, he's, he's right there. Are you gonna eat him or are you gonna make me do it? Yeah, you get him, not me. Look at this. All right, she's seen him again. And the crab's mistake is that it moved. Oh, look at that. Look at that defensive posture. Here, I'll even show you. Watch, Osa, like this. Watch, I'm gonna get pinched now. Ah, yeah, no, yeah, it does hurt, doesn't it? Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. You better get him before he gets back there into the leaves. You want me to do it? Oh, I'm not gonna catch him for you. Right there, Osa. There you go. Be brave about it. Be brave, stay wild. Eat the crab. <laughs> this ocelot. I'm not gonna eat the crab. She took one pinch from that crab and basically said, I think I'm gonna find my dinner somewhere else. And I agree, that crab just pinched my finger and it did not feel good. All right, Mr. Crab, looks like you're gonna live to pinch another day. See you later. We knew that this ocelot may be in the area. We are on the Osa Peninsula right now, and this little one is an orphan. She was raised by a surrogate mother, which was a canine here locally. And we knew that if we walked this trail at night, there'd be a good chance we would come across her. I was shining my flashlight on this enormous wolf spider when all of a sudden I heard these huge paws ripping through the rainforest underbrush. I thought I was about to be attacked by something, and in a sense, I kind of was. It was the ocelot. Hi. Now, as you can see, she's pretty friendly, as long as you're not a wigwam sock. Can you come up here by the cameras and the lights? You know, I always carry an extra pair of socks with me when we're out here in the wild. And these wigwams are going face to face with the ocelot right now. Look at that. Full on claws, full on teeth. I am feeling the power in this cat right now. 
and you can see her claws, I'm trying to keep my fingers away from them, you can see her claws coming out and digging into those socks. And just like a house cat, she's using her front feet and her back feet to claw into that. Look at that, how cool is that? She's actually very aware of what she's doing with her claws. Now, she is playing right now, but even when she grabs onto my hands, she's not trying to hurt me at all. She wants to hurt these socks though, watch this. Oh, good pounce, good pounce. And she's just practicing her hunting right now. Oh, she got that one. That's the whole name of the game. Let me, let me steal Coyote's socks. Somebody shine the light up there. Oh, she's just having a blast up there in the leaves. Now, if I was an ocelot, this is how I would be stalking my prey. I'm gonna try to steal back my sock from her. Ready? Ready? And then, she pounce. Got it. Oh, she is mad. She's not happy. Here we go. Oh! Whoa! <laughs> ah! Okay, okay. Yeah, that's teeth and claws right there. My hands in the socks with the ocelot. Look at that. Oh, she wants it back. There you go, there you go. Why don't you sit here and play with the sock? Oh, watch out, watch out, buddy. Get it, here, we'll do this. Now, how it's alliterate, this is how you do slime. Wait a second, you're putting your own sock in your mouth? Well, when in run with an ocelot. <laughs> I just gotta watch out for those claws. Where's the other one? Here you go. Oh, he got yeah, it. Yeah, mouthful of sock. Where'd she go? Oh, I see you. Here's one. Yeah, I'm gonna get this one back. Ouch! <laughs> got claws there. Oh, this is crazy. Out in the Costa Rican rainforest, playing with a baby ocelot. And she took my sock. I'm Coyote Peterson. Be brave. Stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. You still have your sock. Hey, that's my sock. That's my sock, man. <laughs> uh, can I get my sock back? <laughs> uh, hey, Ocelot. Insect Sting Pain Index needs no new introduction in relation to the work that we do. And my climb toward its summit began with a small creature known as the harvester ant. This experiment into what happens from an onslaught of stings opened the door to a world of pain that I would attempt to endure in the name of education and science. Ah, that was one on my neck. Mario, get the one off my neck. If you were watching this video, there is a good chance you remember the velvet ant. Also known as a cow killer, this wingless wasp is famous for having the largest stinger in the insect kingdom. A sting from that creature was intense, but it didn't end there. This is the worst sting I've ever taken. Oh my gosh, guys, this is super bad. The tarantula hawk delivered as promised, with a tidal wave of pain that literally put my arm into a state of paralysis. John, give me my arm! And finally came the moment that the world had been waiting for one and only bullet ant. Ranked as having the most painful sting in the insect kingdom, it seemed as if I had conquered the sting pain index mountain. Oh, the stinger stuck in my arm, look at that! I had reached the summit. I had done it. Or had I? Whispers began to drift amongst the YouTube comment section, and questions began to arise as to whether or not the bullet ant was truly the king of sting. Oh, it's burning more! It's getting worse! Hold on, hold on, hold on! These whispers turned into a haunting echo. What about the warrior wasp? Coyote, have you heard about the warrior wasp? Are you going to be stung by the warrior wasp? Warrior wasp, warrior wasp, warrior wasp! That is an enormous nest of angry warrior wasps. Man, we're a lot higher up there than I thought. This is gonna definitely be tough. I look again, 
Double check. Yep, those are warrior wasps. 100%. And that nest is so big, there are probably thousands of them in there, all inside the walls. All it takes is a little disturbance for them to literally spill out and swarm like mad. And they're incredibly fast, much faster than your typical paper wasp. The local expert that tipped us off to this field where he said, yeah, I've seen warrior wasps there before, actually at one point threw a rock through a nest. And I was told that they spilled out of the nest so fast, he barely even had time to think about running, let alone making an escape to try to get to his vehicle. And in the process, he was stung multiple times and had to go to the hospital. We do know they are incredibly fast and incredibly aggressive. So for Mark and Mario, we're gonna actually set up a mosquito net here underneath the overhang of this tree. Now that will hopefully keep you guys safe and out of the sting zone, because as we know, the sting zone goal with this is simply on my forearm, not all over our bodies. I'm gonna be wearing a bee suit, so hopefully that will protect me as I go in to extract one of these ornery little insects. And with any luck, we're gonna get one up close for the cameras. Known as one of the most aggressive paper wasp species in the world, these beautiful insects carry the warrior moniker from their commitment to attacking anything that disturbs their nest. However, very few people have ever been stung by one of these insects because unlike normal paper wasp species, they often build their massive nests high up in the trees of the central and South American rainforests, a place where humans virtually never encounter them. Let's go catch a warrior wasp. All right, guys, I think I'm ready. Let's get you tucked underneath the uh, net here. Now, in the event that I am swarmed, it is best for you guys to just stay completely put and underneath this. Wrap yourselves up as tight as you can. There's a good chance they're not gonna get through there. It's a mosquito net, so all the webbing is very tightly wound. So yeah. Nothing can really get through this, but still it's gonna be a pretty nerve wracking experience if this thing gets swarmed by the most painful stinging wasp in the world. All right. Are you guys ready? Ready. All right, guys, I am now going to slowly approach the nest. And the goal is going to be to just hold the net up in the air and see if I can get wasps to actually come to the net. If I am swarmed, it is gonna be one incredibly bad situation. I'm very close now. We're all down on the low end. Whoa, starting to swarm around me. There are a couple moving around me left and right. My tactic was simple. Coax a single wasp from the nest using my extendable GoPro arm, and then quickly swipe it up using my entomology net. This was primed to be one of the most dangerous animal catches I had ever attempted, as disturbing the nest could literally mean thousands of these fearless warriors swarming me and the crew. Okay, I'm going to cut this handheld camera and go for a catch. Here we go. Definitely got one, a big one too. Woo! Holy cow, that totally worked. Okay, there it is, right there in the net, you see it? Yeah. And what I did is I just provoked one off the edge with the aquapod and got it right into the net. Check that out. Wow, okay, now this is the difficult part. I need to safely get it out of the net and into the capsule. Give me one second here. Oh man, my arm is shaking. That was the most perfect swipe I could have possibly attempted. Nothing got scared, it was wasp on the edge of the net. I just poked it with the aquapod, it came off. One swipe, and I had it. Hold on a second. Right down here. Yes, there it is. Wow, there you have it. That is the warrior wasp. Oh my gosh, that is a large wasp. Wow. Uh, I was excited to catch it, and now I realize I have just sealed my fate. 
That is crazy. Whew, look at the abdomen on that creature. Well, part one of this mission is in the capsule. Part two is to get me stung. Ah, I have a feeling this may be just as bad as the bullet. Just based on the knowledge that these are extremely aggressive, I have a feeling that the sting is going to be unbelievably painful, but I am mentally prepared to take this sting. And I know that this is the moment that everybody's been waiting for. We thought that I had climbed the insect sting pain index and reached the summit, and that was it. The bullet ant was it. But of course, we all knew that we teased the warrior wasp at the end of that episode. And ever since, you guys have been asking for it. So today, Coyote Peterson, is going to deliver. Here we go. There it is. That is a warrior wasp. Now the ultimate question that we are answering today is, will the warrior wasp's sting be more painful than the bullet ant. Ah, I have to just sit back for a second and admire this creature. How can something only that big, about an inch in length, possibly contain such a potent sting? Look at that iridescent blue coloration on the wings and its abdomen almost looks as if it's covered in velvet. You'll notice the body structure of this wasp is very distinct. Of course, it has the head, it has a thorax, and then a very, very narrow space between its thorax and its abdomen. Now, one thing that I did notice when we saw these out flying around the nest is when they fly, they actually turn their abdomens upwards to a point in the air, very different looking than other wasp species that we see flying around. Now, it's interesting is that this thing looks like a warrior, and when all of them are together and they're on the outside of the hive, what they will do to ward off anything that's thinking about getting into the hive is they will go boom, 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 boom and sometimes they are actually called drumming wasps because they beat their wings together all in unison and that's where they get the name warrior wasp. It sounds like soldiers marching. So when I look at this creature and its fierce appearance, it definitely reminds me of one determined warrior. And you know, the other thing that's real interesting about these wasps is they have massive front mandibles. Now, this is a species that will kill caterpillars and bring them back to feed their young, but they mostly feed on nectars and sugars. So this is not a creature that's out there hunting for itself, only hunting for its young, but those front mandibles I could easily see would be used to decapitate or kill something like a caterpillar or a grub. Whoa, it's an intimidating face on that creature. Almost looks like the face of the bullet ant, uh, but of course it has wings and uh, a slightly different body structure. This is the only time I have ever seen a blue wasp. Look at that. Now, just like we did with the tarantula hawk, the way to get this animal to sting me is we're gonna actually place the glass capsule inside of this net. And I'm gonna take off the glass top, let the net fall down on top of the insect, and I'm going to pick it up with these entomology forceps. I think you guys all know the game plan from there. Coyote's arm goes down on the table, the insect touches my forearm, and a sting is induced. Now, of course, for safety, we always have an epinephrine pen on set, just in case anybody's wondering. I'm gonna just place this off to the side at this point. And if you guys are ready, let's get the warrior wasp into the net. Mark, are you all set? I'm all set. What happens if the wasp gets aggressive and flies at us? Ooh, that's a great question, because I will tell you what, this is one fast insect. Now, when I am stung, as always, I'm gonna try to get the glass capsule back over top. If I do not, and the wasp flies off, just hold your ground for a second. Good chances, it just wants to escape, and it's not gonna come after you guys. But if you are stung, I'm pretty much just gonna turn the cameras around and film you guys to see what happens. <laughs> Uh, let's not do that today. Let's hope that doesn't happen. Well, so far I have managed to get every one of these stinging insects back inside the glass capsule so that we can safely release it back into the wild right where it came from. And with any luck, we'll be able to pull that off again once more today. Let's keep that streak alive, please. Yes, yes. For you guys' sake, let's definitely keep it alive. Mario, are you ready? Ready. Mark, are you ready? 
I'm ready, if you're ready. All right, I am going to slide the warrior wasp off to the side. You stay there, buddy. And I'm going to place the net right in the middle of the table. Uh, just like I did with the tarantula hawk. I'm then going to replace the capsule right there. And I'm going to lift up the net. See that? Good, you guys got that shot? Yep. I'm now going to remove the glass capsule and let the wasp. That's a little delicate procedure. Oh. Okay. The wasp is in the net. I'm gonna gently pin it and I need to grab it right at the back of its thorax. Got it. Perfect hold. Yes. Okay. Wow. There we have it. Okay, I'm gonna have to do this quick. And that is about as good a hold as I am going to get. Oh, I can see the stinger. Whoa, look at that stinger. I'm Coyote Peterson, and I'm about to enter the sting zone with the warrior wasp. Here we go. One, two. My arm is swelling up really, really quickly. Ugh. Hold on, back to the table, back to the table. Okay, so what is happening right now is the venom is getting into my bloodstream, right? And what's happening is it is breaking down the membranes around my blood cells and it's causing them to scatter. Now there are cells in there that are neurons, right? Those neurons are sending messages to my brain that are screaming pain, pain, pain. And trust me when I say there's massive amounts of pain going through my arm right now. Mm. Initial onset is not as bad as the bullet hand, but it's an electrical shock similar to that of the tarantula hawk. Hold on, let me compose myself here for a second. Uh, uh, uh. Oh my gosh, the pain is actually getting worse as time goes on. And I don't know if that's actually the venom taking hold or that's just the neurons firing to my brain saying, you are in a lot of pain right now, Coyote. Hold on, guys, give me a second. Uh. Can you see the red? Seem more squirmy. Ah! Uh, like you can't sit still. This is this is more of a continuous sting than the bullet ant was. This is this is this keeps firing. This just keeps firing. Cut this GoPro. Ah! lightheaded you know you when you get into a really hot shower and the steam sets on you feel like you're gonna faint I do feel like I'm getting close to fainting and that is not good I'm just trying to control my breathing ah look at that welt man yeah, you can definitely that thing know. walloped me I can only imagine what it would be like to be swarmed by these just a single sting dwarfs the sting of a yellow jacket. 
the initial sting was not as painful as the tarantula hawk, but then it set in and it was electrical in nature. It felt like an electrical current going into my arm. And I, you know, I was over here, I was hitting the ground saying, it's not as bad as the bullet ant, but in its own way, it's different because the bullet ant hit me and then just kept radiating. This feels like I'm being stung over and over and over. It's really swell. It usually don't swell that good. Look at that. Go ahead, uh, put your hand out. Feel the tautness of my forearm. Oh yeah. And you can see. Oh yeah, big time. Stinger insertion point is definitely swollen. It is very much isolated. It almost looks like a little BB or something underneath my skin. It's like a, that's, you know, you're acting more like you did with the bees with that, the immediate welt. You know, my body may start to react differently to venoms. At this point, I'm just feeling really lightheaded, very hot, my arm is very hot, and not feeling necessarily like a state of paralysis like the tarantula hawk, but my- Any tightness in your chest, or? Not my chest, tightness in my hand. Like this motion, squeezing of my hand, is very, very difficult right now. Really having a hard time squeezing down a fist. You can see the swelling setting in there. It does still feel like pins and needles in my arm, but I know that everybody wants me to answer the question. Is the sting from the warrior wasp more painful than the bullet ant? I would definitely say that the bullet ant is worse. However, keep this in mind. If you come across a bullet ant while you're out there venturing through the rainforest of Costa Rica, let's say one lands on your arm, falls out of a tree and stings you, you can easily brush it off. However, if you stumble upon a nest of warrior wasps and you disturb it, you're going to have thousands of angry insects attacking you. And not only are they going to be attacking, but they are going to be chasing as you run through the underbrush. Now, I imagine if you were to take sting after sting after sting, it could potentially be lethal. So word to the wise, if you're out there in the rainforest of Costa Rica, simply admire these animals from a safe distance and always pay attention to your surroundings. As I hiked back through the sweltering rainforest, I could feel the physical and mental exhaustion setting in. Yet I knew there was still one thing left to do. All right, guys, well, my arm is in considerable pain right now, but as always, it is time to release the creature back into the wild. So what I'm gonna do is open up the capsule and let this warrior wasp fly right back up to its nest. There it is, the bullet ant tree. Check out the size of their kingdom. That tree is absolutely massive. I can't believe it has been five years since I was stung by the bullet ant. And at this point, over 50 million of you have enjoyed watching me roll around on the ground in agonizing pain. And I'm sure you're wondering to yourselves, Coyote, why have you returned to this location? Are you going to be stung again? Today we are celebrating that episode, not only its entertainment, but also the education that came out of it so that you guys could learn about these fascinating insects. Now to up the ante, we have created something called the Bullet Ant Box which is probably exactly as it sounds. A clear plastic cube that is going to be filled with stinging ants. My hand is going to go inside and we're going to see what happens. Will the bullet ant sting if not provoked? Remember, when I was stung the first time, I physically held an ant to my forearm to induce a sting. I know you guys are thinking, Coyote, we showed up for the stings. Something crazy better happen. I can guarantee you guys this much. This episode is going to be wildly entertaining. So if you guys are ready, let's get started with the bullet ant box. So why in the world do we catch 20 bullet ants and put them inside of this clear plastic container? Now the purpose is not necessarily to induce stings, it's to celebrate the education that you guys have all garnered from our original bullet ant episode. My entire arm feels like it's having a spasm right now. But today, we're going to determine whether or not the bullet ant truly is an angry little creature. What I'm going to do today is gently place my hand and forearm into this box and set it down. I want to see if the ants will just walk around on me and not get aggressive. I know what you guys are thinking, Coyote, we showed up to see some stings and some craziness, so we're really hoping you get stung 20 times, maybe more, because remember, these ants can sting more than once. Now, just in case something catastrophic does happen, 
We also have an epinephrine pen, just in case I go into anaphylactic shock. This panerotoxin is extremely potent, and to be honest with you, I have no idea how my body will react if I'm stung a second time. So it's always good to take safety as a precaution, and if I have to inject myself with the EpiPen, of course, that's gonna be just as entertaining as all of the stings. Yes, bullet ants bite, but it's the sting, which is armed with a paralyzing neurotoxic peptide known as panerotoxin that is responsible for putting its victim in tears. When it's injected into your bloodstream, it specifically attacks the central nervous system, causing extreme pain that is often compared to the burning sensation of a bullet wound. No reported cases of death have ever been associated with this sting, but depending on venom yield, side effects can include massive swelling, limb paralysis, hallucinations, and muscular discomfort that can last for nearly 36 hours. Yep. I'm Coyote Peterson, and I'm about to enter the bullet ant box. Here we go. One, two, three. Right now, I am just trying my best to keep my calm. The ants are definitely crawling all over my hand. A lot of heat is likely registering off of my skin. So far, no bites, no stings. My heart is going about a million miles a second right now. Now, what I don't wanna do is shake my hand around with any sudden movements. If I do that, all I'm going to do is make the ants angry. Oh man, that is a creepy feeling, having those ants walking up and over my hand. I'm gonna try to keep my hand in there for as long as I possibly can. I'm just trying to control my heart rate at the moment. I'm trying not to move my hand. The ants are crawling around, they are investigating. And they have incredible sensory organs in their antennas, so they can definitely sense that this is something alien in their environment. At this point, they are most likely trying to find a way to get out of the bullet ant box. Oh, I think I'm getting bit on my wrist. Something's biting me. No sting, but I'm definitely getting nibbled at. And the thing about your hands and your wrist is that they are extremely sensitive, a lot of nerve endings. So if I do end up getting stung, it's going to be extremely painful. I'm going to gently turn my hand like this, just to give them another option, if they so choose. Nothing happening. The ants actually seem to be doing their best to avoid my hand. Now, if I took my hand and shoved it into the nest of a bullet ant, their immediate defense is going to be to defend the colony. Inside this plastic box, the ants don't necessarily feel as if they need to defend something. Okay, now one of the ants has escaped and is actually out on the table. Be careful, guys. We've got live ants amongst us. Now, you guys may recall that there is a little... Sorry, so nervous at the moment, even though I'm not being stung yet. Now, one really interesting thing that I know you guys have commented on in the comments section is the bullet ant gloves, which is a very famous tradition in South America that young boys will go through to essentially transition between boyhood and manhood. And the reason that people are stung inside of those bullet ant gloves is because the ants are actually woven into the palm leaves. Those ants, once they wake up, they realize that they're trapped and they begin to sting. Those stings then become the hallucination that these young boys go through and eventually the spiritual journey to transition between boyhood and manhood. At the moment, these ants are not being pressed into my skin. I actually have an ant right here, walking up on the table, kind of getting surrounded by them. And I am not being stung because the ants are not feeling restrained. A couple of them are escaping, that is completely fine. They will just find their way back up into the forest and eventually back to the colony. And I think what we've ultimately proven at this point is that while the bullet ant may be intimidating, if you are not threatening them, if you're not pressing them down on your skin or attacking their home, they have absolutely no reason to bite, let alone sting you. I gotta say, I'm truly thankful for all that the bullet ants have given us thus far. 
I don't think we could have performed a better experiment to celebrate the five-year anniversary of Stung by a Bullet Ant. I know you were all hoping for an onslaught of vicious stings so that we could have a good laugh watching me roll around on the ground like a big baby. It's fair to admit, I was nervous at first, but I'm glad I was not stung because it helps us recognize that bullet ants are not aggressive toward humans unless provoked. If you stomp on their mound or hold one to your arm with a pair of forceps, you're going to get stung. Otherwise, they simply want to go about their peaceful existence as they forage for food in the rainforest. Brave Wilderness found a creative way to put the bullet ant in a very bright spotlight. And in turn, this little insect helped us drive forward a brand that now promotes conservation and shares education around the world. When you really sit back and think about it, it's a pretty cool story. So to you, bullet ant, we say thank you for being such a super cool creature. That is a highly advanced entomology light trap. This is my good friend and world-renowned entomologist, Jim. Say hi, Jim. Hello, guys. Tonight, we are using their powers combined to draw in some of the most fascinating insects of Costa Rica with the goal of catching and then showcasing a handful of them tomorrow under the light of day. But before we get to that, Jim, tell us why is this technology so advanced? Yeah, totally. We have a really incredible light trap that we use three different types of light bulbs to interfere the navigation of the insects. So we have the UV, the white light, and the mercury vapor to attract thousands of insects that we have in this rainforest. Now, why is that light combination so important? What does it replicate? Yes, so insects use the stars and the moon to navigate inside of the rainforest. So now that we have really dark conditions, it's like the perfect time to really attract thousands of insects in this light trap. So we are intercepting their path, and with any luck, we're going to see some really cool insects. This is gonna take a lot of time though, arguably all night. So we're gonna sit back and enjoy the show to see what sort of creatures show up. With over 14 years of experience, Jim's field entomology research is unprecedented, as he humbly boasts the discovery of more than 30 new insect species. A true fanatic of creepy crawly things, he has dedicated his life to rainforest conservation. And as we are about to learn, it all begins with the bugs. All right, Jim, we are about two hours in since the lights turned on. There are easily over a thousand insects on the screen at this point. But when it comes to biodiversity in Costa Rica, do we know how many insect species there are in this country? Yeah, absolutely. So let me explain a little bit exactly the biodiversity that we have in this really small country in Central America. Costa Rica has almost 6% of the world's biodiversity, which is insane for a country of this size. Uh -huh. And we estimate that it's around a million species of everything, you know, plants, insects, mammals, birds, reptiles, and many things more. Really, a million species within Costa Rica? Yes, exactly. Okay. And 60% of that, over 60% of that, actually are insects. So we don't know an exact number, and that's probably because you guys are constantly discovering undescribed species. Totally. You know, what we know is at least 20% of what we have inside of, the, of Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. We really unknown, you know, the biodiversity of our country. So the insects that we're going to see tonight, 80% of them are still undescribed and are named for science. Really? So you're saying 80% of the bugs we might see tonight could be undescribed. So we could be totally. seeing new species that you've never totally, seen before. Totally. So here's an idea. You're an entomologist. You know your species. Some you may not know. So it may be suitable to put you up to the challenge to see how many of these you can actually identify. What I'd love to do is get you up next to the screen and say, all right, I'm gonna point at one and you tell me if you can identify it. Okay. And let's see how many you get right and how many you just don't know. Absolutely, I take the challenge. You're up for the challenge? Okay, let's see if, you, right. can, let's see if you can name some bugs. <laughs> We're gonna go big. What's that? This is one of the fruit feeding moths that we have inside of the rainforest. Ooh, how about <laughs> this one? That is Silophanes, a sphinx moth, really important pollinator. Ooh, what's that? This is basically a moth that is mimicking a really toxic group of beetles. So that is a moth? It's a moth that pretends to be a beetle. Jim, what's that? So basically, this belongs to a family that we call Cosidae or leopard moths. Another moth. Great. Another moth. 
All right, I'm gonna guess that that is not a moth. Jim, what's this? Yeah, people think this is a type of dragonfly, but actually it is not. It's one of the ant lions, and this is a predator of insects. Okay, I would've guessed wrong. I thought that was a dragonfly. Ah, uh, okay, let me look. Moth, moth, oh, here we go. What are those? Well, they are basically a really important group of pollinator beetles. Uh, ooh, what about this thing down here? Look at what I've got. Oh my gosh. Ah! It's a, it be a new species, hold on a second. All right, all right, I know what this is. Cicada. Totally. Uh, okay, this one is bizarre looking. What in the world is that? <laughs> I love this group of insects. We call it fulgorid, and they are really colorful. Let me show you. I need to be like really fast you because they jump. It, no, 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 they're oh, okay. fine actually. But let me show you how what? cool. It's like a dalmatian over there. Yes, absolutely. All fulgurids are amazing here. Is that a moth? They are related with the cicadas actually. Oh. I mean, related, closely related with the cicadas. Not a moth, imagine that. <laughs> okay, look at this. Is that a new species? It's so cool, right? And actually, we have two, two species of the same, the same genus. Oh my gosh, you're right. Can this you is see? like, yeah. yes. They are so similar, but they are like, you know, different. The wind patterns are totally, totally different. And am I right? Is that a moth? It's a moth. It's a moth. It's a moth. I got one. <laughs> okay. And what kind of moth? It belongs to the Erevide family, too. Mm -hmm. So, not a new species. It's not a new species. Looks like it could have been, but. Okay, so let's look at these right here. What are those? Well, you know, coyote, sometimes we don't know what we have and it takes time to realize what it is. I don't know what it is. Uh, are you talking about this one or are you talking about that one? I think it both. <laughs> both of them? Yes, I don't this know what This looks they are. like some sort of bat creature. I know, right? I'm assuming it's some sort of a moth, right? It is a moth. Both are moths. Both but, are moths. But that looks like a piece of a stick. Yeah, totally, like a piece of wood, right? It's perfect camouflage. So you're saying you don't know what these two are. These could be nope. undescribed species. Absolutely, absolutely. And sometimes, you know, we need to collect those specimens and then to do the a dissection, to check the genitalia, to compare it with the closer species, to figure out which kind of family it is. And then if it's unknown, we can describe the species. Maybe this could be we'll the coyote. Just leave that for now. We'll just say these are pretty cool. <laughs> We're not gonna invade their privacy like that. Mm -hmm. Ooh, what's that one? Oh, okay. This is a group that we call Arctide. So uh, I love this group of moths. They're trying to resemble, you know, really like dangerous species of wasp. And that is why, you know, this species looks like this. Sure, I understand. So aposematic coloration, mimicking a wasp. Correct. I was really thinking I was pointing at a wasp. Yet again, it's a moth. <laughs> All right, well, I would say without question, Jim knows his bugs. And what I've learned is that if it's not a moth, it's probably a beetle. Now, Jim, for an amateur entomology fanatic like myself, if I want to identify insects out in Costa Rica, is there a good field guide that you would recommend to everybody out there watching? Well, we have almost 11 years developing one app. So, you have an app for this? Yes, exactly. So we are one of the authors, and Biosur has been putting so much effort to put all this information in the pockets of the people. We have Animals of Costa Rica app, so we have mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish, insects, and many things more, you know, in this app. How many species have you guys cataloged so far? 7,000. So oh, oh my gosh! What? Let me see! What? This is insane! Coyote! Oh my oh gosh! gosh! Oh my gosh! What? Dude! <laughs> oh my gosh, this is insane! It's one of the largest That's beetles of beetle. our planet! Holy cow, that is an enormous beetle! Okay, that's the biggest thing we've seen the entire night. No, don't even show the audience yet what that is. Holy cow! Yes! Dude, all right, yes. that is going to be the yes. ultimate bug of the yes. night. This you're gonna absolutely have to see. Oh my gosh, I cannot believe the size of that thing. It's insane! Holy cow, what kind of beetle is that? This is basically Megasoma lephas. Oh, the Megasoma lephas! Beetle the largest <laughs> beetle of our planet! I don't know what that means! But it's awesome! Ladies and gentlemen, get ready to meet the elephant beetle. This is the moment we've been waiting for. Jim, I'm gonna let you do the honors. Let's bring the beetle out of the container. I'm gonna place my arm out in front of the lens. Man, my hand's even shaking a little bit. Here we go. Coyote Peterson is about to handle the elephant beetle. Are you ready? I am ready, go ahead. One of the most strong beetles of the planet in your hand? I am ready. All right. Ah. 
Oh, <laughs> those really claws are now. sharp. <laughs> wow, that thing, it, it has serious weight to it. I have never held a beetle that heavy or that strong. Ow, 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 okay. Yeah. Let's see if I can just get it to calm down in one spot there. And it's so spiky, is the legs as well. Very spiky. Now, I know the first thing that anybody's going to notice out there watching is that dominant horn. Jim, what is the point of the horn on this animal. Yeah, totally. So this is a male, so basically just the males, they have that beautiful horn, and they use that for combat between males in the forest canopy. So when they see another male around, and especially if there is a lady around, you know, they're going to start like fighting and creating a huge combat between each other until one of them drops down on the ground. Now, when it comes to something of this size, believe it or not, they're capable of flying, are they not? Yes, exactly. So these guys are not able to really take off and fly away just from the ground. So they need to climb up trees uh, to get in the forest canopy. And from there, they can jump and take off. So because they are super heavy, this is the second heaviest insect in the planet. What's but bigger than this? The Hercules beetle. Wow. Maybe it's possible that the big tree behind our setup is what this would have dropped down from. Yeah, absolutely. So the light for sure attracted uh, this guy, but yeah, you can realize that it's uh, one of the most heavy insects in the planet. Okay, so I'm obviously taking the impact of these grappling hook-like claws and all the spines on the legs, but I know one question that the audience definitely wants answered. Is this creature capable of biting? Does it sting and is it venomous or poisonous? No, at all. It's a harmless animal, okay. really, really friendly animal. Um, you know, so people normally like they feel afraid when they see these enormous creatures, you know, inside of the rainforest or around the houses in rural areas in Costa Rica. But yeah, I mean, it's a really friendly creature, actually. Yeah, you know, it's very intimidating looking. I mean, they say don't judge a book by its cover. You can't judge an insect on its alien nature. This looks like something that would you know, grapple onto you and just inflict a painful bite or a venomous sting, but like you said, completely harmless. So what threats does an animal like this and all insects for that matter face within the Costa Rican rainforest? Yeah, well, Coyote, I feel really worried about the conservation of this group of animals because they are crucial for the functioning of our ecosystems. 40% of the biomass of insects are gone in less than 10 years in Costa Rica. And there are three really important problems that still we need to work to fix this. So we are facing, you know, the loosening of habitats that is around 60% of the threats of insects. And also, you know, the using of pesticides in our crops, which is creating a huge problem with this, the biomass of insects, and of course, climate change. Okay, so it breaks down into three categories, essentially. Mechanical, the destruction of environment. Chemical, which is pesticides and pollution, and then all inclusive with climate change itself. Totally. And what happens if, let's say, all the insects on our planet were to disappear? What then happens to humankind? Yeah, we disappear with them. So people do not realize that we depend on insects. So all the insects are the most important creatures. We cannot imagine birds without insects. We can imagine that we're going to get food in our table without insects neither. People are oftentimes afraid of insects because they're misunderstood. And what we're realizing in talking with you, Jim, and working with your team and filming this episode is that insects need conservation. We're worried about things like polar bears and rhinos and all of these megafauna species. While that conservation is certainly important, these creatures need our support as well. And you're doing something very interesting in the Osa Peninsula with your organization, Biosur. Tell us a little bit about the focus and the goal for what you have going there. Yes, so one of the major goals that we have right now is to keep protecting you know, the tropical rainforest. Still, there are many areas that are for sale that are you know, um, you know, unprotected. And that is what we're trying to do, to protect the habitats of really endangered species that keeps disappearing in our planet. You know, it's crucial. And I think it's, you know, to save the rainforest would be one of the best solutions against climate change. Jim, thank you so much thank for you, having Bidote. us as a part of your research on this trip. You're amazing. Uh, we're gonna release this beetle back out into the wild tonight, so we'll show you guys some of those shots. But Jim, this has been fantastic. All right, can I challenge you something? You challenge me, I challenge you. Oh, you're gonna give me a challenge? Of course. What's the challenge? To put that animal in your face. <laughs> <laughs> on my face, wow, okay, well. Yeah, it's. I'm not one to turn down like a challenge. Thin, so you should try that. Okay, I have a feeling that everybody okay. out there watches. Like, yeah, Coyote, let's see what happens when you place that on your face. Man, I'm kind of okay. actually worried a little bit about my eyeballs, but okay, right. here we go. All right. I'll put it on, the, must try on that. the side of my head. Okay. I'm closing my eye, though, for this one. <laughs> All right, ready, here we go. Okay, one, one two, two three. three. 
Oh no, the nails. <laughs> you can see how much how strong it is. Oh, it's in my ear. Oh no. <laughs> oh, wow, that is really, really sharp. <laughs> okay, I think we can get the beetle off now. Okay, okay, okay. Protect right. my eyes. Oh, no, 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 no. <sighs> well, there you have it, guys. The Ouch. ultimate Ouch. bug amphitheater. <laughs> oh, Jim, Thank that you. was awesome. <laughs> During my time spent working alongside Jim, I garnered a new understanding for the importance of insects. To put it simply, without these alien looking creatures, many of us consider creepy, there would be no us. Insects are pollinators, and without them, the plants from which we rely so heavily as a food source for survival would disappear. And if the plants vanish, it's just a few measly years before the human species as we know it ceases to exist. It's a harrowing reality whether you want to believe it or not. And the only way to slow, or maybe even stop it, begins with preserving the rainforest. The Biosurf Foundation aims to do just that, but they need your help. As a nonprofit, they promote rainforest conservation, scientific research, and environmental education. The future of our rainforests relies upon the unity of our efforts. And if you would like to get involved, learn more, or even make a donation, Please make sure to check out their site and follow them on social media for weekly updates. Hmm. Coyote. Why is there a car battery on our porch? Well, guys, tonight we're going to do something a little different. It is around 6 o'clock and it gets dark early in the rainforest. And when it gets dark, the bugs come out. So what we're going to do tonight, with all these things you see on the porch, is build a bug theater. A bug theater? Like, uh, is there going to be a performance of acrobatic insects, or what's happening? Well, there's certainly going to be a performance of insects. What we're going to do is run a stretch of paracord between these two poles and then hang from it a white sheet. Uh, the past couple nights, we've been filming episodes out here on our jungle base camp porch. And with the lights, in come the bugs. Yep, this may be a little hunt going on right here. Let's have you get out of there, praying mantis. This is the glass frog segment. So we thought to ourselves, why not bring the bugs in intentionally and film the bugs that want to hang out with us in the first place? That sounds awesome. So we actually don't have to go anywhere. They're coming right to us. Nope. And then we're going to light up this enormous 250 watt bulb. Mario, bring that monster over here. Check this out. 250 watts. And it gives off these UVB rays that the insects are attracted to. Right. There are all sorts of bugs that are going to come to our theater tonight. I guarantee you we're going to see cicadas. There will also be moths, some sort of wasp and hornet type creatures. Um, and if it lives out here in the rainforest, there's a good chance they're going to want to show up to share popcorn with us tonight. So Mario's going to help me get everything set. Then we're going to sit back, relax, and wait for the bugs to come to us. Dun, 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 dun. So... You know, Coyote, that theater screen looks an awful lot like a bed sheet. You know, Mark, as a matter of fact, it is a bed sheet. But it's extremely high thread count, so it'll be extra comfortable for our insect friends. Really? Mario, I heard you got this, uh, the bed sheet from Walmart. That's not my sheet, is it? No. God. All right, so you got this modified black lamp which is going to uh, soothe the insects into landing on this sheet. Kind of looks like a red lamp. Kind of. This is just for protection. We were traveling with this. Ah. Um, all right, Coyote. Yeah. Uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, put that over that beam right there. Okay. And we could hang it down on top of the lamp. So, Mario, explain the, the uh, theory behind having a black lamp with the mercury vapor lamp? Yeah, so it's, it's pretty complicated. Both these types of uh, lamps will actually emit UV rays in different frequencies, and insects are attracted to them. Different species like different frequencies of UVB or UVA. So this black lamp is actually going to help soothe the insects into landing, whereas this big boy here is going to attract them from a distance. Right, so that this is like the bat symbol. Yeah. And then this is like, this is like the spa mood lighting. Exactly, yeah. It's going to give them the mood to be like, hey, let's land on, on this gotcha, sheet. Yeah. I gotcha. All right, All right, let's clamp this down. Yep. Right there, secured. Okay. Oh, let's run that stuff behind the sheet here. Yeah, there you go. All right, we'll get this set up on the car battery. Here's the fun part, guys. Mario, strike right. the lights. Let's see if it works. Light it up. 
There's one. There's two. Whoa! Yeah! Woo! Okay, yeah. you guys ready for the big one? Let's see it. All right, here we go. Uh, oh, whoa. whoa, man, that is bright. I'm gonna go around the other side and see what that looks like. Hey, okay. we already got a beetle. I think it's working already. First yeah. bug of the night, came right in. Wow, look at that, we've already got our first bugs coming to the lights. That means the show is about to start. But you know we're missing, right? Oh yes, you can't watch a show without some snacks. You guys hungry? Yeah. I'm ready, let's get popping. All right, get the popcorn in the microwave. I got butter popcorn too. Nice. I have been known to make a pretty good bag of popcorn in my day. First step is get those kernels nice and loosened up. Now, it does have palomitas, is that popcorn? I think so. Yep. Looks like popcorn. Let's give it a shot. Why not? All right. Now, there is a trick to popcorn. You don't wait till they're all pop, you wait till the frequency slows down. So it's getting there, hold on. I get the microwave new. I guess I was now. just about to say that was it. Okay, there we Ooh, go. Ooh, that smells good, act two. Woo! Get the steam coming out of that, Ooh, nice. Yeah. Popcorn mm. in the jungle. I always like to have a hot piece. Get a hot piece out of there. Hot, hot. <laughs> it's so hot, your your safety yeah. glasses are fogging up. Mm, man. Is it good? Oh, it's good. Here, try some. Ooh, that is hot. Perfect pop. Sorry. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, let's head out to the theater and wait for the bugs to mm. show up. All right. Coyote, how's that popcorn? The popcorn's great, but you may notice that we are missing our enormous light bulb. That's because we blew the bulb. And then we had a backup bulb, and we also blew that one. So we have replaced it with a metal halide bulb, and we still have the UV bulb. Now you see that some insects have shown up. We've got a little sweat wasp here, we've got a beetle, we've got a cicada, and several different species of moths. Now the lights have only been on for about 10 minutes, so what we want to do now is simply sit back, relax, and wait for the insects to show up to the show. Oh man, these glasses really work. It totally looks 3D. Man, I'm just waiting for something huge to fly in. Some sort of big Katie did or praying mantis. We're kind of waiting for some larger bugs to end up on the screen before we really get the cameras up close. Check out this field guide. Insects and other arthropods of tropical America. Pretty much anything you can think of is in here. Actually, let's look at this little critter right here. Mario, bring your camera in close for a second. Let's see if I can identify it. Now that appears to be some variety of tiger moth. It's really interesting because its wings are clear except for the black outer edges and then the abdomen is brightly colored, which I'm guessing is aposomatic to warn any potential predator that, hey, I may be toxic, or because I kind of look like a wasp, I may sting you. However, the antenna look exactly like the antenna of a moth. So there you have it. Our first identification of the night, some variety of tiger moth. That's pretty cool. A lot of little bugs, tiny bugs. Look at these little itty bitty moths. And whatever these little tree hoppers are. Whoa, 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 what's this? Look at that thing. What is that? Ooh, I don't know. But it looks like it might sting. Definitely looks like it might sting. Yeah. No, I'm not gonna just grab it, who knows? Whoa, here it comes. Ooh, yeah, that's definitely some sort of wasp. Let's see if it'll come back down. Where'd it go? It's up there in the rafters. You see it up there? Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's some kind of night wasp. There's a wasp right there. Great, poke the wasp. Well, I want it to come down here on the theater. <laughs> we do have some things up in the rafters here. It's actually because we got some light reflecting off, up onto this silver area. Oh, so far, so good. Ooh, look at that little... Whoa. What was that? There's a little click beetle of some sort. Hold on a second, I scared it. 
and it came right down here in the dirt somewhere. All right, well, oh, here it is. This is awesome, a little click beetle. Never seen one this color before, watch this. You ready? All right, Mario, you're gonna have to zoom in on my hand. The thing that I love about click beetles is they jump, like little Mexican jumping beans. You ready? Okay. Oh, no, that's on my hand. My thumb. Oh, you see that? Yep. That's how they get away. They click with their thorax and their abdomen. They have a very rigid outer exoskeleton and their wings are also very rigid. Look at that. Very pretty. I've never seen one that color before. Hi, buddy. Oh, I see you. Fine. Cool, did you get that? I got that. Where did it go, right back on the theater? Yeah. Neat. That was one very colorful little click bug. All right, well, got more visitors showing up. Uh, here's one that we definitely can easily identify. Come here, buddy. Whoa! That's a noisy one. That right there is a cicada. are out in force right now. I'm trying to hold on to you gently. There we go. You see that? What I love about the cicadas here in Costa Rica is they're really brightly colored. Green and blue. Look how gorgeous that insect is. Now here's a really interesting thing about the life cycle of the cicada. Now the adults, and this is an adult right here, will lay its eggs on the side of a tree. And when those eggs start to hatch, the nymphs fall to the ground and bury themselves beneath the surface. And what they turn into is this. But that's actually just a shell right there because once they become large enough, they crawl up from the ground and then metamorphosize into an adult. And that cycle just repeats itself over and over and over again. Now some summers you will have major hatch outs of these nymphs and you'll have hundreds of thousands of these cicadas up in the trees, which is what we're experiencing right now here in Costa Rica. What would you say, Mark? Literally thousands of them have been kind of orchestrating the background of every episode since we've been here. I would say tens of thousands, like it, it's deafening. Yeah, and you can hear that sound right now. Are you not gonna not make the sound? Where, where's the sound coming from? The sound is, is actually a vibration in the abdomen. You can see, let me kind of fold the wings back there. You see that little hole oh. behind the wings there? It's like a little speaker. Yep, that is okay. where all that loud sound is coming from. And it's interesting how they can uh, make the calls in unison. There's definitely like a chorus like rhythm to it. Yeah, for such a simple creature, they certainly do have an elaborate form of communication. There we go, now you're getting more comfortable. See, I wasn't gonna eat you. This is a great food source for, oh, there it goes. This is a great food source for a lot of the other animals out here in the rainforest. As far as the little shells go from the nymph stage. Yeah, no, it's, it's not exactly a potato chip. All right, let's see what other sort of bugs are showing up to the theater. Coyote, you got something big. Whoa! Crawl with the black light. It's about to go over the top. Get it, get it, get it. Oh, it is an enormous cave eater. Hold on. Wow, the hooks on its legs are strong. Let me get it off here. Ow, 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 ow. Its legs are incredibly spiky. Hold on, I don't want to let it go. I didn't even see this fly in. I turned around for a second. These can actually give you a pretty good chomp. Really? They bite? Oh yeah, they will. Okay, there we go. Ah! It is just latched on my arm. Let me hold it like that. Ooh, it's biting my bracelet. Ah! Oh, it's like pierced through my skin. All right, I'm gonna actually just have to hold it right there for a second. I think maybe if I let it walk on my arm, I can get it off. I'm afraid it's gonna bite. bite. It's about to bite you. It's getting over the edge of your... There we go. Woo! Wow, those legs have incredibly sharp little grappling hooks on them. Uh, that is some variety of Katie did. Ooh, ooh, it's trying to bite me. Ah, ah. Let me turn it like this. I'm trying to get a good hold on it. Wow, it's actually really aggressive. And it's actually really good at spinning its body around. And what's gonna happen if it grapples onto me is it's gonna be locked in place and then I'm gonna take a pretty nasty little bite. All right, that's kind of an awkward hold right there, but I think for the moment that's gonna have to suffice. Um, let me put it on my leg. Ooh. All right, let me see if I can just oh, keep it. your pants, I can see it. <laughs> ah! Oh! Did it bite you? Ah! Yeah! Jeez! 
Okay, now it's on the ground. Let me pick it up with something else. Man, that wall of my hand. Jeez. Saw that coming. Gosh. Let me get off the ground here. Wow. Man. Oh, yeah, it broke skin. Let me see. Wow. Right there. It dug into my thumb. Oh, let me see it. Oh, you see it starting to bleed? Oh, yeah, right two there. little bite marks there. Wow. Ugh. Who would have thought? And look what it's doing. It is actually, it is turning its body. I can't hold on to it properly. It's biting into my pants now. Let me just hold it there. I can't get on here. Oh, it's one angry little insect. Okay. Okay. Stay. Stay. Do you know anything about this insect coyote? Well, I'm used to catching katydids in Ohio that are not capable of giving you a really painful chomp, but this variety here is far different, and it put a wallop on my thumb. Now, this is the largest bug that we have seen show up to the theater tonight, and of course it's just fitting that it would chomp into me. I'm not sure exactly what variety this is, but it is the largest katydid I have ever come across. Now uh, it's much more comfortable now, and that's what it wants to do, just to stay completely up on top of its legs. And look at how long its antenna are. Okay, look, there you go. It is cleaning its legs, and its legs are like little grappling hooks. Ooh, look at those wings. What an impressive insect. Okay, I'm gonna let go of him. Here we go. You gonna stay on my knee there? That could be good. Yeah. Ooh, look at that display. Well, how cool was this? We set up a bug theater and came across all sorts of interesting and bizarre insects, but I would definitely say that this enormous Katie did topped off the night. All right, guys, this is it. Yes, they're calling it from the head. We've got a green tree viper. It's taken us 12 hours to get here, but let's rewind the clock and see what it took to find this snake. Let's go. I hate the morning. I have an artificial sun. It is 3.40 a.m. right now. I'm about to leave to go pick up Mario. We're gonna head to the airport. It is very it is very hard vlogging when you're half asleep and you've only had four hours of sleep. Today, Trent Coyote and I are heading to Costa Rica in search of a really cool snake, Botryakis lateralis, the side-striped palm viper. So you could kind of call this 24-hour find a viper challenge. We finally made it to the airport, and I beat Coyote and Mario. This is good, I can slow move, I can relax. I am starving. I could use a bacon and egg and toast. It's way too early to be away. Mario, how stressed are you right now? Are you stressed? Every time I get to the airport, I'm stressed. This is a very unique challenge for us. Usually we show up to a location, get acclimated, game plan, go out and look for things, but uh, this one is gonna be a little bit different. Where's the stopwatch out right now? It's in here. How much time is already allotted? I forgot to start it when I woke up. What? <laughs> Zero. All right, I'll start it right as we're getting on the plane. It's going. It's <laughs> official. You had one job, Coyote. Our first flight is gonna be designated to sleeping. Man, this vlog life is not that easy. You gotta carry the cameras and stuff and all your gear. Hundreds of flights grounded nationwide after FAA experiences computer outage. This was 56 minutes ago, which means we were in the air. Obviously we made it. So I think we're good. I think they fixed it. What'd you get? <laughs> Fruit and donut balls. I'm almost done with mine. So I'm gonna have to get seconds. <laughs> We're under the 20 hour mark. We made it. The big thing that we escaped today was this big shutdown with the FAA and all their computers. So tons of domestic flights today got super delayed. Fortunately, we avoided that crisis. 
We're in Costa Rica. We've arrived at the hotel. Where's our uh, stopwatch there? Where are we at? 10 hours, 51 minutes, and I don't think we have eaten in close to at least nine and a half hours. I'm so hungry right now. Yeah, I'm fading very quickly. Yeah, man, it, feel, it feels good just to like finally get to the hotel. Like, we've accomplished something. We gotta unload gear. Trash and treasure, making things anew. This is the part you don't see in videos, is when we're absolutely exhausted, tired, hungry. Dog. And this is the unique part about this episode, we wanted to show that. Well, that's fun. Okay, this is spot to eat. Okay, we are 12 hours and seven minutes in. The good news is we're at the halfway spot and we're currently fueling up on food. Dinner was okay, it was a, I think it was a bit of a miss. We didn't do much research because we were just desperate. When you're desperate and you're hungry, you go for it. Okay, the sun is down. It has officially been 14 hours at this point since we left on our excursion. Yeah, this is it. This is the moment we've been waiting for. You know, we were in Columbus several hours ago. Now we're in Costa Rica. And soon we might find a snake and then maybe we'll get some sleep. Okay, so we've left the vehicles behind. We are now officially at our undisclosed location. Gustavo, what can we expect tonight? Okay, uh, I think that tonight we have a lot of uh, possibilities to find a, a green snake, the Botryechis lateralis. This is the perfect habitat. So it's an arboreal snake, so we need to check all the plants and trees in the area. This is the moment we've been waiting for, right? Since I woke up this morning, I was just waiting for this moment to be with Gustavo and Naomi, looking for these snakes. So we are officially at 14 hours and 49 minutes. We have less than 10 hours left to find this green viper. Let's see what happens. Hola, mi nombre es Gustavo Murillo. Soy fotógrafo de vida silvestre. Y yo soy Naomi Méndez, fotógrafa también de vida silvestre y amante de la naturaleza. Uno de nuestros objetivos al momento de tomar fotos es crear educación ambiental. Por medio de nuestras fotos podemos mostrarle a las personas eh, sobre los animales que existen en la zona en la que trabajamos. Es importante saber que eh, no se cuida lo que no se conoce. Entonces lo que nosotros queremos es que, como decía Naomi, que las personas conozcan los, en este caso la herpetofauna que vive alrededor de ellos para que puedan aprender, conocerla, respetarla y así este, que evitar que las maten, evitar este, que extingan muchas especies que muchas personas creen que porque estamos en el Valle Central de San José este, no existen eh, especies importantes cuando realmente hay especies muy importantes que habitan en esta parte del gran este, Valle Central ¿verdad? de Costa Rica. Now, technically, we're going to be working our way up into a cloud forest, which has slightly cooler temperatures and a little bit more humidity. All right, Gustavo, so we're getting to the right elevation where you said we want to start searching, but what should we be looking for? What are the signs? Okay, and this is the perfect place. Okay. So, to find the snake in a middle, high, and in the base of the trees. Okay. Babies and juveniles stay in the base of the trees and adults sometimes prefer the high parts. Oh, so we can be finding babies and juveniles as well. Yeah, oh. and another uh, crazy thing, the babies are different color, no green. Oh, what color are the babies? Like a brown. Oh, so they might almost look a little bit like a fertile ants. Yeah. Okay, I did not know that. Searching up, searching down. Let's start looking. You got a juvenile? A juvenile, but when they start to grow to adult, you can find in color green, of course. All the way up oh, there? I see it. I see it way up there. Yeah. Wow, good spotting. It is up there. Good How did you spot it. that? Oh, practice. <laughs> it's practice, man. Gustavo, you think you can get that snake? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. Cliff on the other side there. Oh, he's got it. He's got it. Okay, okay, okay. He's got it. Look at that guy coming in. Oh, got it. Got it. Ooh. Wow, I I did not think that was possible. Look at that thing. It's gorgeous. 
There it is, our first green viper of the night. I gotta check the time. 15 hours and 10 minutes. We did it. I mean, it's a juvenile, but it still counts. Look at that. Mario, tell us, how are you feeling right now? I don't even care that I've been up for 15 hours. That doesn't matter. My energy is back in full force. Look at this thing. It's gorgeous. Do you guys have enough light? You want uh -huh. to pop a little bit of light on it, Trent? Yeah, it's all good. Why don't we set them up on a little mm -hmm. branch? Okay. We got some tight shots, some B-roll of it. Perfect. Good. <laughs> boom. Boom, got boom, it. boom. Don't get busy. Good, nice. boom. Boom. good one. <laughs> Finding a juvenile first is actually really exciting. It's very beautiful. We're gonna get our shots and keep searching for an adult. 15 right. hours, but we found the snake. The challenge is complete. Now we just have to see how many we can get. This is the ever important part of the episode that we call getting B-roll. And you never know if you're gonna find another snake or not. So this might be the only one we find for the episode. And while we're very excited to have found it, gotta take the opportunity with the animal when you actually have it in hand because we could say okay look it's a juvenile maybe we'll find a bigger one we should keep moving gotta get the shots while you can get them trust me we have learned that lesson in the past that you see one and you're thinking okay well there's got to be more out there this could be the only one and we traveled all this way to find the snake within 24 hours so we're gonna get all the shots we need, all the photography, and then at the end, probably still a thumbnail before we start searching again. All right, now I'm just kind of in the background, narrating to myself, narrating to you, letting Mara and Trent get their type B roll shots. Not much I can do on the GoPro other than this. So stay tuned, we're gonna work on that thumbnail, and then we're gonna keep searching. Oh, Mario, that's a great pose right there. One thing worth noting about this environment is that while it may be perfect for these snakes, the snakes are incredibly well camouflaged because these are all just a bunch of vine tangles and most of the vine tangles are green. Look at this, green vine tangles everywhere you look. And somewhere hidden in there is gonna be this bright green snake. You say there's another one? Hi up. Oh, I see. It. Yeah. Much bigger than last one. Okay. I got the shot. I got the C2. C2? Okay. Okay. Coyote, do you want to get it? Yeah, I'll give it a shot. I'll trade you snake hook for GoPro. Okay. And uh, just keep the light on it. Let's see what happens. Hey, Katie, remember when you're grabbing a snake from above. Yeah. What's the one thing you think you should be aware of? Probably not let it drop on top of me. Exactly. I'm gonna see if I can do exactly what Gustavo did. Get it to actually wrap around the snake pool. Got him. There we go. Beautiful. Look at that viper. All right, I'm gonna very slowly come back out. Got him in great position there. This one's at least twice the size of the juvenile we caught earlier. Would you consider this an adult? Yeah, um, a juvenile to go to adult. Okay, yeah. so we're like the in-between juvenile and adult phase. Let's find a good spot to set it up to get our next series of B-roll shots. Second Viper coming in at 16 hours and 30 minutes. We did it. We successfully came across the Green Viper. Our 24-hour snake challenge is officially in the books. We're exhausted. It's time to get some shot out. But if you enjoyed this vlog challenge, write in the comment section below and tell us, should we do another one of these in the future? We had an awesome time doing it, and hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Big thanks to Gustavo and Naomi. This adventure would not have been possible without them. And if seeing a green viper in the wild is on your bucket list of wild encounters, make sure to follow and contact them on social media. Located in Manuel Antonio, as part of the Gaia Hotel and Reserve, this conservation project is working to rewild and give back territory to these beautiful birds. Forty years ago, the scarlet macaw disappeared from this area due to poaching and deforestation that was directly linked to agricultural expansion. But since this project's inception in 2014, 59 birds have been successfully released back into the wild. 
Today, I'll be working alongside Dr. Anna, the lead veterinarian at Asa Macau. She has recruited me to help catch a bird that is going to be re-released. We'll collect some biometrics, but most importantly, we need to pull a blood sample because hidden in its avian genetic code is a very important answer that will determine this bird's future. Now, before I test my luck at netting a parrot, first, it's time for some breakfast. All right, guys, how are we looking? Just setting up the cameras right now, and then we have a feeding table or tray here. We got one right down there. Okay. And we're gonna hoist it up, or you're gonna hoist it up, and we're gonna watch the birds come flying in. Very cool. Let me show you guys what this feeding tray looks like. This is where things are gonna start to get really, really noisy. Now, there's gonna be a variety of fruits and nuts that we place onto this basket right here. And of course, we're gonna get creative and mount a GoPro there as well, so you guys can get an up-close shot at what it feels like to be a piece of fruit being consumed by a macaw. Okay, the birds are starting to gather. You can see all up in the trees here above us, they know breakfast is about to be served. Chef Coyote and Dr. Anna have an incredible spread prepared for this morning. So these birds are going to have a very nutritious breakfast. So we need two handfuls of nuts and two handfuls of sunflower seeds. Okay, look pretty good. That's perfect. I would eat that. So no fruit goes on here or we just- No, like just this? nuts. Oh, the just the nuts. for the ones in the cage. Oh, gotcha, okay. Okay, so we're ratcheted in there. Is that good like that? Yes. Okay, now what? Oh, now hoist pull the rope. Okay, all right, here we go. This is officially what it takes to feed the macaws. Going up. Nice. Breakfast is served, ladies and gentlemen. By securing GoPros on the food platform, we are able to get you a front row seat at the breakfast table. Hold on tight, we are headed up into the treetops. Feedings happen daily, and today's breakfast buffet includes palm nuts and sunflower seeds. Free to come and go as they please, these parrots were once being rehabilitated in the enclosures below, and are going through what's known as a transitional phase. I think you licked the camera. Eventually, they will adapt to their new wild surroundings and spread throughout the region. This process is all a part of the successful reintroduction of these birds to Manuel Antonio. Okay, birds are fed. Feeding macaws was definitely the easy part. Now it's time for the medical checkup. But before we do, as a good-natured warning to your ears, you might want to lower the volume because things are about to get really, really noisy. I think I'm ready. It's time to enter an enclosure with a macaw. Even entering in with one of these birds is a little intimidating with those claws and that beak. Now, what is the process that I need to go through for safely catching this guy? Just need to put it in the nest. Maybe you have to corner or bring it close okay. to the net or the floor. Oh, I get to use a net. Yep. Gotcha, okay. It's ready for you. Ah, okay, that's a little bit better. I thought I was gonna have to do this with my bare hands. I mean, earlier when I said, do I need to bring gloves? And you're like, no, don't worry about the gloves. I was like, because how strong is the bite of one of these birds? Like, it could take your finger off, right? Yes. Cool, so you're just gonna let me loose into this enclosure and see what happens. Yes. Okay, here we go. See what happens. All right. Hold up. Now, before I go in there and net this bird, it's important to understand why we want to catch it. Dr. Anna doesn't know if it's a male or a female, and to find out, we need its blood. Let's talk about avian DNA sexing. That fancy term is a process used by scientists to correctly identify a bird's gender, and it requires a sample of blood to get the answer. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Can't you just go in there, lift up the bird's tail feathers, and determine if it's a boy or a girl? Not exactly. Male and female macaws are nearly identical in size and color. They also lack typical reproductive organs, which means that the only way to determine this species' sex is to pull a DNA sample. Okay, here we go. First things first. Let's see if I can catch a bird. Here we go. Hey, buddy. How are you? I'm just gonna try to get you in the net. Yep, not feeling that. I get you. I get you. Okay, there we go.
Maybe if I just put this above it. Nope. Okay, buddy. Walk on in. There we go. Okay. All the way in. Okay. Not too squawky. And I haven't been bitten. This is a good thing. Okay. You can put all the pressure you want here, but you don't. Not, a, not, not your on fingers the neck here. Okay. No, not on the neck. Oh, right there. Kind of right behind the jaw. Whoa. Okay. Let's okay. Take it outside. All right. I'm holding a macaw. Very intimidating to have your fingers that close to the bird's beak. Look at how sharp it is. Let's go on out here. Okay, I'm gonna move real slow. Trying to make sure we put as little stress on you as possible. Pretty good, not too much squawking. Okay, okay. Now the skull of this bird is absolutely massive. Look at the beak. Extremely powerful, very sharp. Don't wanna get your fingers in there. One of the coolest things about these birds is look at all the white skin on the side of the face with no feathers. Really makes you feel as if you're holding on to a dinosaur. This next part is going to get even louder. So to save your ears from medieval torture, I will narrate what's happening while you enjoy some peaceful music. The best way to hold a macaw is to keep the wings tucked in, almost like you were cradling a football. But the most important thing is controlling that beak. Dr. Anna shows me how to secure the head to avoid taking a bite. And fear not, this causes absolutely no discomfort to the bird, as I am literally holding onto solid bone wrapped in leathery skin. The goal is to work quickly, but efficiently, as the bird undergoes its routine checkup, which includes swabbing for viruses. You know, when I have to get COVID tests, they've got to swap me. Mm -hmm. An oral dewormer and an anti-mite spray. Remember, Dr. Anna doesn't know the sex of this bird, and its blood is a genetic roadmap that leads to the answer. So most importantly, we need that blood sample. After it's drawn, the blood will be sent to a lab for analysis, and the gender will be determined before the bird's release back into the wild. Don't worry, we will tell you the answer before the end of this video, so stay tuned. Now last, but not least, we put a unique identification ring around its leg. The characters on this tag are like the bird's social security number that can be used to identify this individual if it is ever caught in the future. Okay. And there you have it. That is how you properly do a vet procedure checkup on the Scarlet Macaw. Dr. Anna, thank you so much for allowing us to participate in the work behind the scenes here today at the Macaw Sanctuary. This was certainly an experience I didn't imagine I was gonna be having this trip to Costa Rica, but these birds are absolutely beautiful. I feel as if I made a special connection here with little Squawky. That doctor's checkup wasn't too bad, was it? Well, if you guys want to check out the sanctuary, click on the link in the video description below and help support these beautiful birds. The Scarlet Macaw is one of our planet's most iconic bird species. Yet unfortunately, with their elegant beauty, has come the human desire to trap and trade them. Many of the birds living at Asa Macau have been rescued from the illegal pet trade some of which will be rehabilitated and released back into the wild, but some that will never be able to go free. If you have a love for macaws and want to help in the reintroduction to Manuel Antonio, please consider making a donation. Every effort counts, and if we all help, the future of these birds will become even brighter than it was before. And now, the moment you have been waiting for, the official gender reveal. The lab results are back, and our parrot was a girl. Since the filming of this episode, she has been safely released back into the wild. And with hope, she will go on to lay eggs and carry forward the repopulation efforts of awesome Macau. Tonight we're in Costa Rica, exploring one of our favorite wildlife preserves. This location is incredibly biodiverse, which means there are countless species that we can come across. I'm going to attempt the grand slam of night herping. And if you don't know what that is, I'm about to show you. In baseball, a grand slam is defined as a home run with the bases loaded. And it counts 
for four runs. On tonight's adventure, I am redefining the Grand Slam as I attempt to find not four, but five unique species. An insect, an arachnid, a frog, a lizard, and if we're lucky, a snake. So if you guys are ready, let's see what we can find. Grand Slam! Got a lizard right here. Look at this. That is a Costa Rican green anole right there. Holy cow, I have never caught this species before. There's no given that I'm gonna catch it. Now look at that, it's asleep, hanging right down off of that fallen leaf. Wow. Look at how vibrant green it is. It looks just like a leaf hanging down. I might be able to use my snake tongs to gently lift this fallen leaf up and off of this branch. Okay, let me check this underbrush, make sure there's no fertile ants. Last thing I wanna do is step on a venomous snake. You see all this dense brush here. You get excited about a lizard before you know it, you step on something that's gonna bite you and possibly kill you. All right, let me see. It's working. That is the Costa Rican green anole, an absolutely beautiful species. Now, this lizard was just asleep, and that's because they are primarily... Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and catch him at this point before he gets away. Woo, look at those little teeth. Now, this is primarily a diurnal species, which means they're out hunting under the light of day. At night, they keep themselves hidden in trees so that they can avoid any potential predation. I'm gonna slightly readjust it so that we can get a better look. Oh, God, there's a little bite right there. Those are some sharp teeth. Okay, there we go. Readjusted the lizard. Now, you'll notice those big eyes. These have incredible eyesight. They primarily feast upon insects. And you can see that really long tail, nearly twice the length of its body, used to help balance this lizard when it's up in the trees. All right, well, how cool is that? Costa Rican green and all, we officially count that as the first run of the night in my attempt to hit the Night Herping Grand Slam. All right, I'm gonna actually climb back up this hillside and put the lizard in the tree that it was sleeping in. Okay, we've got a red-eyed leaf frog just out here in front of me by about 10 feet. And whenever you handle an amphibian, you wanna make sure that you've got moisture on your hands so that you don't actually draw the moisture out of their skin. so gently. There it is. The red-eyed leaf frog. Obviously this frog gets its name from those brilliantly red eyes and you'll notice those vertical pupils. These frogs have incredible eyesight at night and during the day they will cling to the underside of leaves to keep them hidden from predators. But at night like this they are out in full force feasting on pretty much any insect that they can come across. And when you think of amphibians in Costa Rica, the red-eyed leaf frog is without question the most famous frog species that we have here in country. Look at those beautiful red toes. Now each one of those toes has a little sticky pad on it that allows them to easily move throughout the environment. You can see the bright blue and yellow coloration just on the underside of the back legs there. Let me see if I can get it to actually walk out onto my other finger. Whoa! Actually, just jumped on your camera. Don't move. Let me see if I can get him back over here. There we go. I'm always excited any time we come across a red-eyed leaf frog here in Costa Rica. I would definitely say that this species counts as our frog for the night. We are off to one fantastic start. Okay, we're about to check off the arachnid run for the night. That is a tailless whip scorpion. About the most nightmarish looking creature you can come across. Believe it or not, they're completely harmless. Not venomous, not poisonous, no stinger, no fangs. And the way they eat things is they have these crab-like grappling hook forearms that they grab onto their prey with and shove it right into their mouth. You wanna know why I think they're so creepy? Watch this. The second I make contact with one of those little legs, it is going to dart back into that tree. Oh, look, it's reaching out its little antenna to sense me. Oh, you see how fast that thing moved? Woo, living nightmare number 101 right there. Oh, this is great. 
That is a stick bug. Now this insect is not going to move if I don't make contact with it. It is completely relying on its camouflage at the moment. And here comes some sort of daddy long leg spider crawling right up next to it. Let's see, I'm gonna gently get it up onto my hand so we can take a closer look. I don't have to worry about being bitten or stung. These guys are oop, completely harmless. There we go. All right, buddy, you can get up on my hand and you stay still for a second. There we go. And there are a number of different stick bug or walking stick species here within Central and South America. And I couldn't tell you exactly which variety this is, but some of them can grow up to nearly two feet in length. Each and every one has a unique design to it which helps keep it perfectly hidden within the environment. All right, I'm gonna let him back up onto the tree here. Well, I would say that that definitely counts as our insect of the night. Why is these old rotted boards leaned up here? Be a good spot for things to hide behind. Oh, there is a scorpion. Look at this. Kind of tops our earlier arachnid. I feel like we should try to take a look at that guy. Now, I am not super familiar with the potency of the scorpion species here in Central America, so this is not an arachnid that I want to get stung by. But it's in a really great position for me to be able to just gently get a hold of the end of its tail and see if I can slowly work it out. Oh, jeez, he almost got me. Oh no! Oh no! Oh. It literally got right into this hole in the ground. Yep, he's coming right up. Coming right up and out of the hole. There is our scorpion. And actually the better play here might be for me to just let him up and onto this leaf. Oh, no, nope, he's stinging. Got him. There we go. That is a forest scorpion of some sort. Now I'm guessing that the venom of this scorpion is on the toxic side, considering the fact that it has very small, very slender pinchers. The rule of thumb is that if a scorpion has slender pinchers, less crushing power, which means that the sting is going to be more potent. You can see just how razor sharp that stinger is right on the tip of the talson as not a venom that I think I want to experience. Very cool. I think I'm going to actually take the tailless whip scorpion off the list and count this as our arachnid of the night. All right, let's get this creepy crawly back up into its little burrow. Got a baby photo ants right here. Nice. This is gonna officially be our snake of the night. Right. What's crazy is that when fertile ants are babies, the little tip of their tail is yellow, and they will use that to lure in prey. They'll just sit in the leaves, completely camouflage, wiggle that back and forth, something will come close, they can strike out, and then they've got a meal. Yeah, there we go. Let's see if I can just, oh, that's perfect like that. Get a real good look at just how cryptic that coloration is. This snake would be so well hidden in the leaves. Now, even as a very small juvenile like this, this snake is still incredibly dangerous. Its venom is just as potent as an adult, and while the venom yield may not be as high, it would still be a medical emergency. See that puffing up its body, saying, okay, now I'm gonna get into hidden defense pose. Puff myself up a little bit so I look bigger. I'm intimidating, you don't wanna mess with me. No, we certainly do not want to get any closer than this. Now, this may be a young of the year, and the females are ovoviviparous, which means that they give birth to live young. The eggs actually develop inside of the snake, hatch within its belly, and then are birthed live. Now, in this curled up pose like that, you can see this S-shaped design. That snake is ready to launch and strike, and the little wiggle of the tail right there is basically a warning that says, don't get any closer. Oh. See that? <laughs> Even you jumped. Even you jumped. Wow, that snake literally launched itself from up on top of the rock right down into the spot. 
like I said, that is about as close as I wanted to get. And I would say this is probably a good point to wrap up this episode. We came out tonight hoping to hit the grand slam of herping. We've come across an insect, an arachnid, a frog, a lizard, and finally, last but not least, the teeniest, tiniest little fertile ants, our snake of the night. Grand slam! All right, buddy, we're gonna let you off into the night. I'm gonna go this direction. <laughs>